Hi, my name's Mark. You're watching Rock Spring Church TV live. If this is the first time you're watching our live service, we welcome you. If you've come back for more, welcome back. Without further delay, let's dive into today's message. Why is it, let me say this, why is it that um, in every other relationship in life, we'll take the good with the bad, but when it comes to God, we only want the good? That's, that's a, something to think about, isn't it? Uh, um, Scott, you were at my house yesterday. Was my puppy good? What? You're lying. You're in church. You can't lie in church. <laughs> and, and, and my other neighbors sit next to them. Is your puppy always good? No, they're not, you're not sitting next to them. Is your puppy always good? Don't lie, because you told me. I, I've heard stories. But what is it? What is it? What is it about the puppies we have? What's the good and the bad? I love Colby and Bentley. Like, like, like. I mean, I love them more than I do some people. And, and yet, and yet, in order to in order to receive that from them, I'll take the poo and the pee, and and with the little Yorkie, the ear piercing, like oh god, it hurts when they bark. But why is it? Why is it in order to receive that the good from them or our marriage? Why is it in order to receive the great things that come with a marriage relationship we'll accept the other parts that come with it, the, the shoe throwing, the name calling. I mean, it, it, I know that never happens in your marriage, okay? I can only relate to mine. But why is it we'll accept that but we won't accept the good and the challenging that comes with God? And until we do, we're really never going to experience God the way I think you want to experience God. Because you have to be able to take, even Job said to his wife, Mrs. Job, I don't, I don't know what her, you know, her name wasn't in the Bible, but she said, he, you know, he said to her, shall we take the good from God and not the, not the bad? And it's not that God wants bad things to happen to you, it's just that we live in a world, a fallen world, where bad things happen to everyone. And, and I've just decided that I want God in everything good and bad in my life. I would prefer not to have the bad, but I realize that that's not an option. And so, so I, I want God to be in my life. Now, in case you want to, to do this, um, David, our, our media guy, oh, all right. My bad. Can everybody say you're forgiven? No, no, no. Meaning me, me. You're because no, I didn't do that though. <laughs> if you've missed a Sunday, you're not being guilty because you're here, okay? The people that aren't here should be feeling really guilty right now. If you missed a Sunday, and you like the past two Sundays, if you haven't been here and you want to unpack, because I've heard from a lot of people that, that they've never looked at the Lord's Prayer the way we've looked at it the past two Sundays. And so if you would like, if you haven't been here and you would like to do that, at the, at the, guest, at the uh, guest information help desk over here, out the door, you can get three copies of the DVDs. Or if, if you want to go deeper, because, you know, we can only cover so much information and, and sometimes listening to it again, you know, makes you cause you to think more. 
Um, or, I, you know, you can use them to invite people to church. You know, I, I know Scott was saying this yesterday. He tells his friends all the time, my church is nothing like any church you've ever been in. Well, that can either be scary or helpful. <laughs> so, you know, you could, you know, slip them a DVD and just, just say, here, you know, if you want to know how our pastor talks or how, you know, our, our, our youth pastor talks, uh, you can listen to this. Today, I want to move on to hearing God um, because anyone, anyone who really wants to be close to God has to hear God. And I've already asked you do, you, do you want to hear God? And you said yes. But the next question, and you don't have to respond to this, is a simple one-word question. Why? Why do you want to hear God? Have you ever really stopped? For a moment and, and thought why you want to hear God? Because when I talk to people, I talk to people about church all the time. Sometimes it gets old talking to people about church. It's like people don't realize that for me it's a job. Would you want to talk to everybody about your job? No, no just um, but But when they ask me, you know, the, the, how to hear God or that God's not hearing them or they feel like God's not hearing them and, and they relate their story to me. Now, we're not supposed to judge people, okay, but, but I just have an analytical mind. I do this with myself, too. I look at my story or my circumstances or my experience and I'm like, why is it's kind of like outcome-based education, you know, what you put in, you know, and it, it, to me, it all, everything ought to be an equation. And so that's, I kind of view that way with God, and I think a lot of other people view that way with God. But when, I, when you tell me your story, I'm thinking, okay, well, you say you want to hear God, but you don't do a blessed thing. You say, tell me, He wants you to do. So why do you want to hear God? If, if you don't want to do, we're talking about listening today. We're talking about hearing God and listening. And the very first hurdle I think we need to address is that, don't you? Do you really want to hear Him? Because if you really want, if you really want to hear God, you should be willing to do what He says. Because if, if God is who we say God is, that He's perfect, that He's all-loving, that He's kind, He's compassionate, He's forgiving, why wouldn't we want to do what that God says? So I believe the very first hurdle we all need to get over when it comes to hearing God is just on the front end, and here's why faith is important, you have to determine on the front end before he even says anything that you're going to do whatever he says because what he says is what's important. When you begin to approach God that way, he'll begin to speak. And you'll, you'll begin to learn to hear him in ways that you have never heard him before. Because when God talks to you, when you look at the stories of the Bible, when God talks to you, He will generally speak to three primary areas of your life. The first one is relationship. When God speaks to you, one of the big areas that He will talk to you about is relationship. Because, because how you deal with others is important to God. How you deal with your, with your close people in your life, your spouses, your your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your siblings, your children. I mean, but not only that, how you, how you interact with the people at your workplace is important to God. How you interact with, with the culture. And, I mean, and we're not even talking about witnessing now. We're not talking about going out, you going out here and, and being a Christian and convincing someone else that they should come to church with you. God just cares about how you treat people in your everyday life. And so he's going to talk to you about those things. In addition um, to that, he will talk to you about being a life example to other people. He wants to speak to you so that the evidence of him in your life is there so that when you're talking to other people, they're not just seeing you, they're seeing him. And that's relationship. 
But he'll also not only talk to you about relationship, he'll talk to you about time. He'll talk to you about time. How do you balance your everyday life and your life with God? Because you do have two lives. You realize that. You are physical and you are spiritual. And there's no getting around that. We're going to talk about the spiritual part as we end today's message. And I'm already thinking about all the stuff I've got to cut out. Because some of what I'm talking about really wasn't intended, but I, but I think it's important. How do you manage your time? How do you manage your everyday life? Because you have an everyday life. And God wants you to enjoy your everyday life. He had created the world so you would enjoy your everyday life. But He also keeps you here after you accept Him because you have a spiritual life. And He wants that managed too. And so how you, how you use your time is important to God. And He will speak to you about that. And a lot of the time, we'll go back to the very first thing that I said about relationship. Kids rock. It's all about relationship. These kids need God-loving, God-fearing adults that will go in and love them. God doesn't care how much you know about the Bible. Those kids don't care how much you know about the Bible. You know what they're about? Being loved which is exactly what you care about, isn't it? Because when you go to God, what do you want to know from God? That you're loved. That's what you want to know. You want to know that He will be honest, open and honest and fulfill His Word and take care of you. But here's the last thing um, that, that He will... Your resources. Your resources. The house you have, the cars you have, um, money. Well, what do you, and, and here's why God will talk to you about those things. Because, because that is the primary way you'll learn to trust Him. He will talk to you about it. Because your faith can't grow until you begin to do what He's asking you to do, which you can't do unless you listen. But you not only need to listen, you need to act on that. And, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that this morning. I wrote down some quotes. Anybody like to look up quotes, wise things? Yes, I knew there was a, at least one other person in this room. Ernest Hemingway said this, Most people don't listen with the intent of understanding, they listen with the intent of replying. That approach will not work with your Heavenly Father. Let me say it again. Most, and I agree with him. I agree with Ernest Hemingway when he says that most people, think about it, most people don't listen with the intent of understanding what you're saying. They listen with the intent of what they're going to say next. They listen to they they hear about 25% of what you're saying, enough to formulate their next thought, and wait for you to shut up so they can say it. That can't be your approach with God. God will not allow you to listen with the intent of replying. When God speaks, what's the old commercial? E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks. That's the, really ought to be the approach with God. When God speaks, everybody ought to listen. Especially those who call themselves children of God. Peter Drucker said this, the most important part of communication is hearing what isn't said. That's what makes a great marriage. My wife doesn't even have to look at me or say anything to me. I, I mean, generally on Sunday morning, she's up there somewhere doing something with computers, and I'm here, I can't even see her. But you know what? I'll be talking about her, and at the same time, I'll be knowing <laughs> what she's thinking. Amen? Yeah. The most effective part of communication is hearing what isn't said. 
And that, that, hang on to that one because that one's critical when it comes to a relationship with God. The next one is unknown. Um, only those who care about you can hear you when you are silent. Only those who care about you can hear you when you're silent. You have any? You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but you, 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 hopefully you should have someone in your life that you feel that way about, or se hopefully several people in your life. You know what? When you don't feel like talking, you're speaking volumes to those who love you. You know why that's important? Because that is the summation of your relationship with your Heavenly Father. He wants to know you care. He doesn't need your words. We've looked at that the past two weeks. He already knows what you, what you need, what you want, what you're thinking. You know what God wants from you? He wants to know that you care. He, he wants to know you understand Him when, you don't, when you're not saying anything to Him. When you drill down and be, develop a relationship like that, I'm going to get a preview. I've mentioned that I, I think I let it slip in one of the services last week. We're going to be doing a three-week series this fall called The Secret Place. There is a secret place where God's children can, can really touch God. And we're going to be talking about that. But this, this, this kind of it gives a hint to that. Because when you don't have to speak, if you're not in there, you're close to that secret place where you know that person cares about you and you care about them. God wants to know you care. He wants to know you care. He doesn't need anything from you. He wants you. And He wants to know you care. And when I say that, I'm not talking about He wants to know you care about what He will give you and what He won't give you. He wants to know you care about Him that you want a relationship with Him. The more successful my relationship has become with my friends, my wife, my children, the more I've gotten out of it. Now, I'm not saying that should be your motivation. I'm just saying that is the, the end result. The tighter you are, the more you get out of it. The less you have to say. And so here's what I want to do with the remaining time we have. I want to look at some Bible stories about prayer because my goal today when you leave is I want to identify three things from these stories. I believe, I believe the stories of the Bible. I do not believe that they are just stories. I don't believe they were fabrications. I don't believe they were mythology. I believe they actually happened, and I believe the Holy Spirit inspired them to be recorded because they are truth. And because God knows that when we read them and we begin to unpack them, we don't just read them, but we begin to unpack them, that there's hidden truths in there that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us that we can apply to our life to make our life better. That's the spiritual part of, of, of our life. And so I want to look at these stories. And the very first one is is the story of Daniel. Daniel. And just some background, because I'm not going to have time to really do the whole, the whole story justice, but, but the, the, the kingdom of Babylonia came in and took the Jews as captives back to their land, and it was their, it was their habit of taking the best of everything, the best physical thing, the best gold, the best, and the best people, and, and elevating them and raising them up and making them part of their culture. And so Daniel and his three friends, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are, are in this situation, and they're captives, and they're brought back to the king of Babylonia, and they're held up as, as um, men who will excel. And so they try to indoctrinate them. For those of you that are Star Trek fans, and I know there's at least one up in the tech booth, you will be assimilated. So that, that's, kind of what, that's kind of what's going on here. And, and so Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Ezra, 
and urged them to plead for mercy. Now, just so you're not confused, those are the Hebrew names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were assimilated into the Babylonian culture, they were given new names, and we know them as, the, as their new names. And, and so the king thinks very highly of himself, and he's not a spiritual person, and so he basically says to them, you all got to bow down and pray to me, forget your other gods. Okay, everybody remember this, remember this part of the story? And so Daniel, who's kind of like the number one out of the four of them, learns about this, and he learns that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and none of the wise men could interpret the dream, and so Nebuchadnezzar's response, this is a real spiritual way to respond to things, not like in life, he decides to kill all the wise men. Hey, you know, you can laugh all you want. You and I try to eliminate all the things we don't like in our life either, too, don't we? I mean, maybe not that to that extreme, although there have been times that, oh, a anyway. Um, and so he, he tells Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about this, and then he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So I want you to look at his response, because the very first thing he does is urge his friends to get together and pray. Now, remember what I said to you about prayer last week, because, you know, my whole Facebook rant about trying to come to God in numbers. Let me just share this with you. Matthew 28, 19 says, if two agree about anything you ask on earth, it will be done for you in heaven. And so I've seen that verse taken and used as a platform for needing to get other people involved in praying. Can I, can I enlighten you this morning what I believe the real hidden truth is behind that verse? It's not as much about you getting someone else and praying to God and agreeing about what you're asking. I think it's more about you going to God and already agreeing that however God responds, you're going to do it. That's where the listening part comes in. See, there's power in agreement. There's power in agreement. If you don't think so, just look at, at Adam and Eve. Because, because they agreed to eat the apple, didn't they? And, where, and, and what was the result? The, the power was transferred to the devil. There's power in agreement. They agreed to do what God didn't want. God is saying there's power when two of my people will come together and seek me and listen and agree to do what I want them to do. There's power in that. There's power in that. I think that's what Daniel knew. I think Daniel got his, four, his four, three friends together and the four of them went to God and it wasn't as much about asking God to do something as it was predetermining we're in this together. We're going to do what we hear God tell us to do. That's where the power was. Now, you'll remember the rest of the story, right? So, so what happens is, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised God of heaven. I told you last week, prayer always should terminate or culminate in, in prayer. And then... The next thing that happens is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, we do not need to defend ourselves in, in, in this matter. What happened is they got caught praying. And you worry about... They got caught praying. So they decide, we're going to pray, we're going to stand in agreement because we know there's power in agreement. And, and so they get caught praying. And remember what Nebuchadnezzar decided to do to them? We're going to have us a little bonfire. And we're going to have roast Hebrews. And, and so, so he, gets, he threatens to throw them. And I want you to look I want you to look at the first example of the power that comes from this agreement. They say to King, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But then they said this, but even if he does not, 
We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship your image of gold that you have set up. Remember what happens? Then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the God. Your power is going to be in listening to God and in agreement. Now, here's why I think the agreement part is so important. Because the Bible tells us we cannot, especially in our sin state, we cannot go through this life by ourselves. You can't make it by yourself. That's why the Bible says a three-strand rope is strong because if one cord breaks, there's two more. We absolutely must have each other. It's a God principle. And that was where the power was. That Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came together and, and when, when push came to shove, what happened? God showed up in His power. He showed up in His power. Because it wasn't about as much as what they were praying for. It was the power of agreement. God, and so, so here's what you need to understand. God always responds to those who ask and listen. He always responds to those who ask and listen. But you cannot let appearances impact your actions. They didn't, did they? like, nope. Even if God doesn't, even if it doesn't look like things are going to work out the way we want, we want you to know we stand in agreement that our God is God and there is no other. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It was, it was so hot that the people that took them up to throw them in died before they even got in. So they had to step in. How great is your faith? And, and here, I'm, I, mean, I love that story, but and we don't have time to un unpack the whole thing. But it's like when they came out, Nebuchadnezzar's like, he's, he's like, they don't even smell like fire. Wouldn't you love to be able to go through the, the hot parts of your life and come out and, and not even smell hot? I mean, to me, power. But you can't let appearances see. I've spent a lot of time in my life praying, and then when, when things don't look like it's the way Mike thinks it should go, I let the way I feel at that moment impact what I'm going to do. They didn't. They prayed, came into agreement, heard God, and stood fast when God told them what to do. God's responses will always affirm His glory. There was nobody that day that could, not, could deny the God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's pretty hard to deny. These dudes are dying under the order of the king and take and throw them in, and yet they come out and don't even smell like smoke. You can't deny that kind of power. And so God will always, so is so here's the thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to these three things, because we're almost out of time, that I believe are hidden in these scriptures that we can do to become good listeners. But here's another thought-provoking question. Is God's glory the motivation for why you want to pray? Or is it just to save your butt from the fire? See, when God's glory becomes your motivation, that gives God a whole lot more motivation to show up and be God, right? He wants people to see that He is God. But He's also a gentleman because... He gave us the authority to manage the earth. We gave it to Satan. Now God, not that he has to, because God can do anything he wants to, but not because God is a God of honor. 
and because that's what God did, now he needs a reason to come back and get involved. When you, when you become a son or daughter of the Most High through the blood of Jesus Christ, you now have the power to reinstate him back into a situation. But he needs to be invited. And he needs to be listened to. But he's, he's, he's waiting to show up. So here's the first way that I think you and I can become great listeners. Because this is what Daniel did every time, every time he was in a situation where he felt motivated to pray. Daniel learned that the decree had been signed and posted. He continued to pray just as he had always done. His house had windows in the upstairs that were opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he knelt there in prayer, thanking and praising God. Here's the very first thing that I think we can get out of this story. And that is, when it comes to prayer, you need to develop a habit. You need to develop a habit. We're good at developing habits, aren't we? There's not a person in this room that sucks at developing habits. We all have them. But you know what? You know what we need to become good at is replacing bad habits with good habits. Because the Word of God tells us to overcome evil with good. The only approach to getting rid of bad in your life is to replace it with good. Now, when you do that, when you do that, you have to recognize when something's become a habit. Um, I, Scott came over yesterday and was looking at my new garage. But you know what? You know what we didn't talk about was the number of times I still turn right on Taylor Street to park behind the house. There's no garage there anymore. And then I got to go all the way around the block to come to the new garage. Why? It's habit. See, a habit is something that you will do even when you're not consciously thinking about it. it. It just second nature to you. When we talk about prayer becoming a habit, that's what it was for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was a habit. It was, even though they were ordered not to pray, what did they do? They prayed because it was the habit. It was the habit. It was the thing to do. You need to overcome evil with good, which means replace bad habits with good habits. Now, you've all heard the, probably heard the thing that says it takes 21 days to build a habit. Ignore it. Because now, now everything on Google is saying that's not true. Uh, matter of fact, the university, for you college professors, the university the college at London says is now we're like 66 days. But at the same time, they say that there really is no magic number. But habits are things you do without thinking. But they did do a study that said it really, and if you're looking for a magic number and there is no magic number, they are saying that it is not 21 days, it's more like 66 days before things will generally become just part of your life. The good news is you can do it, whether it's 66 days or 90 days, because the study they did was a 90-day study. But they seem to lock in on this on this sick number 66. But But it has to become... A habit. It has to become a habit, which is something that you do without thinking. I'm proud to say that's that's really become a habit in my life every morning. For those of you that interact with me on by text or or email or something, when do you usually get most of my responses? The lesson there is if you want to hear from me but you don't want to be bothered at four in the morning, turn the ringer down. Or your phone's going to be going ding, ding, ding. Okay? But, but that, that's just my time to get with God. And so if you're communicating with me about a spiritual question or something like that, that's probably when you're going to get a response from me because that's the, I've learned and it's my habit that that's when I can become close to God. That's when my mind will slow down and turn off enough that I can actually hear what my God is saying. The rest of the day, all bets are off. 
because I'm as ADD as they come, and I'm a thinker by nature, and I'm type A, and I'm, I'm purpose-driven, right? And so God just knows he needs to wake my butt up early. So you suffer for that. But it needs to become a habit. Here, here's the, so so let's, let's look at a different story to get the second thing. Because Elijah was also a person who was powerful in what he did and in his faith in God. And Elijah went and killed 800 prophets, over 800 prophets, almost 900 prophets. And I know some of you theologians are going to email me and say, no, it was only 450. No, it was 450 prophets of Baal plus. Okay, So you got to be pretty powerful <laughs> to single-handedly kill 900 people. I might be able to do it for two or three, you know, then I'm tuckered out. Um, but then, then Jezebel threatens him. And so Elijah was afraid when he got her message and he ran to the town of Beersheba in Judah. He left his servant there and walked another whole day into the desert. Finally, he came to a large bush and sat down in its shade and he begged the Lord, I have had enough, just let me die. I'm no better off than my ancestors. Then he laid down in the shade and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel woke him up and said, get up and eat. Have you ever been so tired you just wanted to give up? You've just been so worn out that you just want to give up. And, and that's where Elijah was. Um, here, here's a bit of advice. Don't ever make big decisions when you're tired. I have never quit a job, but I have threatened to. And you know what I've noticed the pattern is? Every time I've threatened to quit, I've been tired. Every, you ever wanted to quit a relationship? Every, every couple has come to me for marital counseling and want to save their marriage, but they're to a point where they want to use the D word. The one thing, the one commonality I can point to in every situation, maybe not the circumstances in their situation, but the one commonality that I can point to is in the relationship, they're tired. They're tired. Here's what, you, if you want to hear, if you want to be a good listener, you have to learn you can't listen to God when you're tired. So you have to be in the habit of praying, but you also have to make sure that when you're in the habit of praying, you're not tired. I think that's why God wakes me up at four in the morning. Because I'm not like my wife. It takes her ten cups of coffee and, and two dogs barking to want to go out and pee. I mean, sometimes their eyes are turning yellow. <laughs> and she's still rolling over. I wake up in the morning, I annoy the heck out of her. I wake up in the morning, I, my eyes are open, I'm, no, I'm ready. I'm not tired, I'm, I'm, I'm rested, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, here's the thing, you, you need to make time to rest. You absolutely must make time to rest. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually, you need, Jesus did it. Jesus did it. Jesus got away from the crowds, didn't he? You need to make time to rest. And that's, that's the very first thing Elijah had to do. While Elijah was on Mount Sinai, he, the Lord asked Elijah, Why are you here? Why are you here? He, he wanted Elijah, and he want, I think he says this to you and I a lot. Why are you here? We're in his throne room, right? We want to hear God, but we don't even realize why we're here. And it's because we're tired. And so God sent the angel to feed and take care of so that, so that he could rest and go into the wilderness so that he could get rested to the point that he could begin to learn the last thing that we're going to talk about today. But you, you and I need to rest. You can't hear God when you're tired because you can't think well. Can't think well. And so, so God shows up, and, and 
asked the question, and while Elijah was at Mount Sinai, the Lord asked Elijah, why are you here? And he said, they have torn down your altars and killed all your prophets except me. Now they're even trying to kill me. He's tired. And so, so God begins to teach him this third thing after he's rested. And he said, go and stand on the mountain, the Lord replied. I want you to see me when I pass by. You know, I want you to pay attention to that because I believe, God, that's not only for Elijah, I believe that's for every single person sitting in here this morning. I, I believe your Heavenly Father wants to pass by and He wants you to see Him when He passes by. Because this isn't about the prophets that He killed. It's not about Jezebel. It's not about anything else. Think about it. He's out in the wilderness. It's just Him and God. When God gets you alone and you're rested enough to hear Him, now it's all about you and Him. It's all about that relationship. And that's when He wants to speak to you. And so now He's beginning to show Elijah that. And He said, I want, I want you to see me when I pass by. And all the ones, a strong wind shook the mountain and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. Next there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then there was a fire but the Lord was not in the fire. Finally, there was a gentle breeze. And, and here's, here's what I believe the Holy Spirit wants, wants you to know in the, past, in the last few minutes that we have. God, is never, God never speaks in the noise. If it's noisy, it's not God. God has no need to raise His voice. Because you're not going to rock His world. You're not going to change His plans. There's nothing you can do to alter God's nature or disposition. God is God. That's who He is. And we need to learn to respond to Him as just that, God. He is the God of the heavens and the earth. He is the Creator God. He's the God, the Father of Jesus Christ, who He sent to redeem us and give us the way back to Him. He's that God. And He doesn't need to be noisy. So he's not in the noise. Here's the second thing. He's not in the overwhelming circumstances. The rocks are coming down and the fire is all around. But God wasn't in it. God is not in your overwhelming circumstances. Are you, are you beginning to feel this, this? The whole? I mean, because God wants you to and I to be a great listener. And I struggle with these things just as much. But you know what? The, the health... And, and, and well-being begins with knowledge. But then, then you have to take it out of here and, and do something with it. And we're all on equal ground with that. I, I have as much work and as much effort, have to put as much effort in it as you do after we get done here today. Today is just that we come together, we worship God, and, and we try to come into some kind of an agreement as to how, how to hear God. But then we have to go and apply it. But you need to know first, He's not in the noise. Satan loves to make things noisy, but that's not God. Satan loves to rattle your world, but that's not God. Finally, there was a gentle breeze. When Elijah heard it, he covered his face in his coat. He went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and the Lord asked him again. Why did he ask him again? Because he wasn't ready the first time. He was tired and he was looking at his circumstances. So God's going to keep asking you, why are you here and not moving forward until you and I become good listeners? We have to have the habit of listening, which is not an easy skill to adopt. Elijah, why are you here? Going before God, he will always, he, he will, he will always ask you why you're here. And he's doing that because he wants you to learn to listen. He wants you to learn to listen. One more quote, and this is from an unknown person, but I love it. The smarter you are, the less you will speak. The smarter you are, the less you will speak. That's a, an earthly quotation 
but I really believe it has spiritual emphasis and truth in it because James 1.19 says this, when it comes to you and I approaching God, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. We should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Doesn't that kind of confirm that earthly statement that we just, the smarter you are, the less you will speak. Learn, learn to listen. And here's where we're going to land the plane today. Now we're going to fast forward from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Because you know what? What we're talking about today is becoming spiritual beings. And, and I, I know that, that that term, spiritual person or spiritual being, can, can have kind of a, a non-godly um, tone to it. Because, you know, the world's so spiritual, right? We've got to stop letting them rob our terms and, and, and redefining them. Because you are a spiritual being. Let me show you. In, in 1 Corinthians 3, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church. And this church wants to get close to God, right? And they're wondering why they're not hearing. So, so the Apostle Paul kind of cuts to the chase. That's what I love about the Apostle Paul. My friends, you are acting like people of this world. That's why I could not speak to you as what? Spiritual people. You are like babies as far as, far as your faith is concerned. So I had to treat you like babies and feed you milk. You could not take solid food. You still cannot. Well, I don't know how many of you would come back next Sunday if I spoke to you like Paul did. Well, I don't know. Maybe you would like it even more. Maybe more people would come. I, I don't know. I'll have to try it sometime. Um, you, could, you could not take solid food. You still cannot because you are not yet spiritual. You're jealous and argue with each other. This proves that you are not spiritual and that you are, not, and that you are acting like people of the world. So, when you try to approach God, what's your approach? Is it worldly? Because here's the thing. You cannot continue to seek God in the methods and emotions of the world. And I don't know about you, but I get hung up there. right? I, I go to God in anger. I go to God in frustration. I go to God because I'm anxious. These are all methods of the world, aren't they? They're all motivations to do what, 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 whatever we do. And God's like, no, 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 no. It needs to be a habit. You need to be rested, which means by the definition you can't be anxious or emotionally distraught. You need to be rested. Um, and so we, we cannot do that. And then he goes on and says this. Every word we speak was taught to us by God's spirit not by human wisdom. And this same Spirit helps teach us spiritual things to spiritual people. Here's the truth. You're not going to hear God until you become a spiritual person. Same reason Paul couldn't talk to the church. You have to become a spiritual person. I'm going to pray with you in a moment, but I want, to, I want to share this one last thing. I know I'm three minutes over. When you look at the Garden of Eden, and it said, and I, I've shared this with you, you've been around any length of time, but I want, you to, I want you to actually latch on to the depth of what I'm getting ready to say to you, because I think it's important based on the last verse that I just shared with you. When it says that, that God came to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, the Hebrew word there, is Ruach. And it, it's not, 414 times in the Old Testament, it is not translated as a temperature. So doesn't that kind of make you want to, one, why, in, why when we translated it from Hebrew into our language, this one time out of 400 and some times, why did we translate it as a temperature? And if you really drill down, what the heck difference does it make to God if he comes and walks with you in the cool of the day? I mean, it might matter to you and I, but I just don't think God's going to be sweating. And so when you really go begin to unpack this, because this was kind of this one, this really stuck with me because it was one of my very first challenges and lessons when I started seminary, was to go back and unpack this. And it really means spiritual. 
God came to walk with them in the spiritual time of the day. So think about everything I shared with you this morning. There was a time of day when God would come and walk with Adam and Eve that was his habit. The spiritual time of the day. And the reason that we do translate it as a temperature, because in Jeremiah, the only other time it comes close to it, it talks about, about the Spirit of God being as refreshing as a cool brook. So the whole point there is the spiritual time of the day ought to be refreshing, shouldn't it? It should be refreshing. So God came in the, in the habit time of the day to refresh them and to relate to them so that they could hear what their Heavenly Father had to say to them. And that all changed the one day when in agreement they decided we're not going to meet with God in the habit of the day. We're going to, we're going to do what God, and there was a shift in world power, wasn't there? So here's the good news. Here's the good news. Because of Jesus Christ, there can be a shift of power the other direction. We no longer have to succumb to the world. We no longer have to live like the world. We no longer have to experience the things of the world. But it all begins to going back to where the world began in the first place. Becoming spiritual people. Having a relationship with God in a habitual manner. We don't even think about it. It's just there. You know what? I'm in the habit of relating to my wife, and I love it. I want you to bow your heads, and I want to pray for you this way. Because I believe every week there are people here, when we talk about these things, there's something inside of you saying, I want that. I want that. And if that's you today, I just want to stand in agreement with you. Because there's power in agreement. There's power in agreement. Not, not my words, there's power in God in agreeing. And so, so I'm going to stand with you. If you're praying prayer right now, I'm going to stand with you in agreement that you and I together in our spirits, because we're connected in our spirit, we're connected by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to stand in agreement with you, brother and sister, that we're going to listen to God and we're going to respond the way God leads us to. And we're going to walk through the fire. And we're going to come out smelling better than when we went in. And we're going to experience God, God. And we're going to know that we know that we know that He exists and He He is in. Why? Because as we listen and we respond, He's going to show up and He's going to reveal His glory because He is the only one worthy of glory. But you know what the good news is? You and I, those of us that stand in agreement and we're faithful when we go out into the week and we do this, we're going to bask in His glory which is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They basked in his glory, didn't they, when they came out? Because Nebuchadnezzar gave glory to the God he didn't know. They gave glory to the God they did know. So Holy Spirit, we just give this day to you. I am so grateful for the opportunity to serve in this church. Father, I stand in agreement with every person that's praying to you right now who wants to become good listeners to develop that habit. Give them the power. Empower them. Give them us all. Give them the things that they do not have in, in our own human fallen nature. But give them the things that Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we could have. So that we can become restored to you. So that you can reveal your glory. And we can be confident that we are your children. Father, I pray right now that you'll begin to speak to some people about this fall and the importance of our Kids Rock ministry. And you'll begin to, to just show them what, if anything, you would have them do to begin to invest in the next generation. Father, I pray as the senior pastor of this church that this church would not experience what many of the churches in our country is experiencing, the threat of, of, of extinction. Because we're willing to invest and give to our kids. And you're going to raise them up. And we're going to be the better and richer for it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I love you guys.
Thank you for watching today. We hope you were really blessed and encouraged by today's message and listening to the Word of God. If you want to find out more, go to rockspring.net. If you want to give to support our ministry, go to rockspring.net and select Give. We look forward to seeing you next week for another live recording. In the meantime, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this YouTube channel with your friends. Rock Spring Church TV.